Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Freedom of the Press Foundation's ongoing webinar series on our programs and advocacy efforts. I'm Ryan Rice, the membership coordinator here at FPF. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, today, we are diving into the Danger Zone. Hosting the conversation is Danger Zone creator and longtime FPF collaborator, Micah Lee, and one of the developers on the project, Francisco. Thank you both for taking the time to talk about this powerful tool. Um, I believe the Zoom Q&A is open, so feel free to submit questions at any time. We'll have some time at the end to address them all. The session is recorded and will be added to the FPF archive in the coming days. Um, thanks again for joining us. Micah, Francisco, I'll let you both introduce yourselves. Um, Micah, I'd love for you to kick things off. Um, I love a good origin story. Um, hello, I'm uh, Micah Lee. I'm uh, the Director of Information Security for The Intercept, and I'm also an investigative journalist there, and I um, uh, I made Danger Zone. Um, Francesca, do you have the slides? There you go. And I guess, do you want to just introduce yourself, or, or should we wait a few minutes? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can introduce myself now. Uh, I am Francisco Rocha. So I'm working with the Freedom of the Press Foundation specifically on, on Danger Zone for the past year. And I'm very much passionate about like protecting journalists and making sure that they can do their own work, but uh, like being able also to keep sources safe and Danger Zone is a great way of achieving that. So um, I'm sure everyone here has heard the advice to not open attachments. And this is really good security advice because attachments can be uh, dangerous for a number of reasons. Um, uh, they could hack your computer. Um, uh, but for journalists and also for activists and for all sorts of other people, uh, this is advice that's impossible to follow because for people like us, it's impossible. Like th this is our job is to open attachments or to open other documents from untrusted sources. So I have to open documents all the time. Sometimes um, they come in emails. Sometimes someone sends me documents and signal messages. Sometimes they come in through SecureDrop, or sometimes I find a data set online that I want to research and it's full of documents and I have to open them. Um, and uh, yeah, so I have to open documents all the time. So does everybody else. It's kind of impossible advice to follow. Um, I mean, it's still good to not open stuff that's especially sketchy, but if you're not sure, there's no way of really knowing what's in this document without opening it and looking. Um, and so that's kind of where uh, Danger Zone comes in. Um, the reason the documents uh, are malicious is because, um, uh, yeah, they could contain malware. When you open a document, it could try and hack your computer. It could, uh, you know, have an exploit for... Microsoft Word or LibreOffice or PowerPoint or your PDF reader or whatever. And there's also uh, other other issues with documents like they could be phoning home. Maybe it's not actually malicious, but just by opening the document, you're leaving traces that you have this document and you're opening it. And maybe uh, you don't want that, especially if you're a journalist and this is a you know an internal document from a company or something and you don't want them to know that you're you're looking into them. Um, yeah, and then another problem with, uh, documents, especially with journalists is a lot of times you get documents that, um, are really newsworthy. You're planning on publishing them, but, uh, just publishing the raw documents could out your source. Um, and there's a, a, a few ways, but one of the big ways is, is metadata. Almost document formats are really complicated. Um, there's a lot of different types of documents. There's like PDFs, there's, uh, all the different office formats. Um, and, uh, there's images, they all have different types of metadata. And, uh, as we'll talk about one of the things that Danger Zone does is it strips the metadata. So it makes it a lot safer to, uh, publish a document that you run through Danger Zone than to publish a, just a raw document. Um, and then also, you know, sometimes a document might be redacted, but it might be redacted badly. Like there's definitely been documents that I've seen where it's like a PDF and there's just a black box drawn over some text that's supposed to be redacted. But if you just select the text underneath, you can copy it and paste it and still read the text. And so Danger Zone 
uh, solves that problem as well. Um, yeah, so in uh, early 2020, I made the first version of Danger Zone to basically help with this problem. Um, I, uh, at the time, I used cubes like all the time and I was very into it. And cubes have, is, so cubes is an operating system. And uh, it's a very cool operating system where everything that you run runs in virtual machines. And it had a feature called trusted PDF, where basically if you have a PDF and um, you're worried that it's malicious or it's going to hack you, you could uh, right click on it and uh, uh, convert it to a trusted PDF. And then it used virtual machines to basically um, uh, essentially copy the PDF into disposable virtual machines, make it safe, and then give you a PDF that you know is safe. Um, it was really cool, but it had a number of problems. The biggest one being that it only worked in cubes and that the people who really need this, um, I don't think are cubes users. Uh, like almost all of my colleagues that are journalists that I work with every day use Macs um, and, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or Windows, or a few people use like Ubuntu, but um, Cubes is not a very popular operating system, especially for, um, uh, you know, the thousands and thousands of journalists that need this stuff. So uh, I basically decided to make a version of trusted PDF that, PDF that works in any operating system. Um, and I also, you know, changed it so that it works with more than just PDFs. It works with um, a variety of office formats and with images. Um, and it does other stuff like it uh, will OCR documents and it compresses the PDF when you're done. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, that's basically how it all started. And I'm really excited that Freedom of the Press Foundation has taken over development of it because um, I'm very busy and it's uh, really nice to see uh, the project being alive with lots of uh, new features getting added and under active development. Awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, go yeah. for it. Okay, perfect. And so, as Michael was saying, basically, it's there are three main use cases. So, malware removal, source protection through, for example, redacting metadata, and also the privacy aspect of like not phoning home. Uh, but it has gone beyond like the original idea of the Kids Trust PDF, also in the sense that it's, it can use like everything other than like PDFs. For example, it can use Word docs or images. And yeah, as Michael was saying, it's like multi platform. And yeah, so just to go a little bit more in, in depth into like the security flaws that viewers can have, there was a recent one that was from uh, February 14th of this year where uh, on, I think it was on uh, the uh, Microsoft email client. And basically like as soon as the, the user would like open or like they wouldn't even need to open the PDF, they could just like, like there would be a preview panel and immediately the user would get uh, compromised. And this is something that Danger Zone can help with, like assuming that the user disables any kind of preview or anything like that. So these things exist and they are pretty, um, they exist in the wild and the majority of the issues are typically with the preview application. And also to illustrate a bit the, the metadata that Michael was, was talking about, uh, this is an image from an article that was published in, I think 2016 by Vice and it included the location of the person they were talking to, which wasn't supposed to be revealed and uh, uh, just by the way that Danger Zone works, this metadata here will be removed. And so the final version doesn't have it. And lastly, also like the, the uh, privacy aspect of like not phoning home, there is a simple way that you can like generate a document which when opened will phone home. And this is, this is really the last thing that I think journalists will want uh, just to have some documents uh, phoning home to whatever organization that it was from. And from the user experience, it's very much like a desktop application. So you just go to dangerzone.rocks, the website, and you download the application. And then you also need to install the second application called Docker Desktop, which is what allows Danger Zone to create the, a, a certain isolated environment 
where the conversion takes place. So it doesn't affect the rest of your computer. And then it's just a simple application where you select the files uh, that you think are suspicious or that you want to remove metadata from. And after that, you just uh, choose some settings. For example, what language do you want to make the uh, document searchable at the end? Or for example, if you want to preview it after the conversion is finished, or if you're, for example, doing a batch conversion with a bunch of documents, maybe you don't want that. And after they're done, all the documents are already sanitized. So they are stripped of metadata. They uh, are stripped from potentially malicious stuff. And then you can open it directly, or you can share it with other colleagues. And supposedly, they're, they're much, much uh, safer. And to give you an idea of like how Danger Zone does, it's, it's not magic. And basically, what Danger Zone does is it creates a sub uh, part within your computer where the document is reviewed. So it's kind of like a sandbox where it's open. And PDF documents or other kinds of Word documents or images are very, very complex formats. They can have like images within documents, documents within documents. And with complexity comes the possibility of security flaws. And so Danger Zone opens it in this separate com uh, compartment within your computer, which is disconnected from the internet, which protects essentially from the document being able to phone home. And then it kind of tracks screenshots, or it's the same thing as kind of like printing the document. So if anything bad happened, it would be within that, uh, within that isolated compartment within your computer. And then it reassembles these images into a final document, uh, like as, as if you were to scan them. And so this analog hole, um, like the separation between printing and scanning or taking screenshots and then reassembling is really what gives Danger Zone the ability to protect you. Because an image is just a series of pixels, which say the color at which position. And so it's extremely simple, and we can make sure that it's, it doesn't have anything more complex or anything that can be bad for you. And then at the end, to actually make it usable for journalists, like images by themselves aren't searchable. So we do optical character recognition to be able to search and select text within documents. And we also compress it because images are huge in size. And so the final version needs to be uh, compressed. There are a few limitations at the moment. Uh, so Danger Zone isn't available on mobile. And there is currently not, uh, not yet a way to preview files before the conversion. So for example, some users had feedback like, hey, how can we know the language that the document is in? Uh, and so we can't do that yet. Um, but And also, like we don't support password-protected files at the moment. But we already have uh, some of these things in the works. And we have a couple of future goals. The first one being kind of bringing back the idea of converted, uh, convert trusted PDF within cubes, uh, which then became Danger Zone, and then back into cubes. And the thing is that Danger Zone has gone beyond the features of convert trusted PDF. Uh, so basically, it already has, supports multiple files, like other than just PDFs. It does the compression. It does the optical character recognition to make the document searchable. And so the idea is kind of like to bring this back into cubes. And the advantage will be that now uh, someone can use it within cubes and then use virtual machines, a kind of like stronger isolation than what Danger Zone uses, uh, to be able to do the file conversion. And so this will be not only a security uh, improvement, but of course, assuming the, the, the person is already using Cubes OS, but it will also open the path to integrating it with the Secure Drop workstation. So the workstation is a project that Freedom on the Press Foundation has been working on for the past few years. And the idea is to protect the journalists who are opening and receiving all of these documents from sources. But the way to do that is basically by using Cubes OS and opening these files in a disposable virtual machine. And so the journalist using it then can immediately see the files. But what happens if they need to, for example, uh, share it with a colleague that doesn't use Danger Zone or doesn't uh, have access to the workstation? So 
Um, so sorry, so that doesn't use cubes OS. So the idea here is to also be able to protect other people in the newsroom who don't have direct contact with the workstation. And so essentially, we run it through Danger Zone, and then the file is already sanitized. We also have plans for doing a security audit uh, later this year, or the beginning of, of next year, which will be performed by Include Security. And so this will make sure that the code is actually doing what it's, do, what it's supposed to do, uh, make sure that there aren't very, any uh, big flaws. And if there are, we'll fix them. And then we will also have plans to do a redesign of the website and doing a UX review of the application. So doing some studies with users and UX experts to make sure like, hey, is, is this, are users using this properly? Do they have any confusions? How can we make the process smoother? And that's mostly it. So to sum up the whole presentation, documents have a bunch of challenges for journalists. Firstly, they can't go without actually opening them for their jobs, but they then get exposed to potential malware attacks metadata leaks, and also the possibility of the documents phoning home when they open it. And so basically what Danger Zone does is sanitizing these documents by kind of like photocopying them and then putting all of the images back into a final uh, PDF document. And lastly, it's also uh, good for security against most kinds of uh, attacks. So just like any other software tool, uh, danger zone increases the cost of an attack, but it's not it's not 100% bulletproof, just like any any other thing. Uh, but it's much much better than just opening the document directly, and so it kind of like lowers the barrier of entry to security by bringing this this feature that was originally only available to CubeOS users to a mass audience. And so, if you want to check out the tool, you can visit dangerzone.rocks. And I think that's it. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, can you hear me okay? I think I was having audio issues before. Yeah, I think I can. Yeah, you're sounding good now. Great. Um, there's a couple of questions in the queue. I'll, I'll read them to you guys, and we can answer them live. Um, the first one regarding future goals. Um, do you hope to make it usable, usable via mobile in the future? OK, so the, the thing with making it available in mobile, like mobile is, is key to to, to like in, in the current world, but it's it will need to probably be an entirely different application because fundamentally mobile operating systems are made in a different way. And so, and they're much, much harder to control from a software developer's perspective. So for example, on a desktop app, uh, operating system, we can just run an isolated environment, but when we're developing for mobile, we only have app access to just the, the application itself that we're developing. And as far as I understand, the, the infrastructure to do this kind of like isolation isn't there yet. yet. Um, what's your understanding of that, Micah? Um, so I think that I don't see how Danger Zone could really be ported to iOS. That seems very challenging because I don't think that I, that we'd have any good sandbox to do the conversion in. Um, Android, it might be possible because Android is based on Linux. It might be possible to run Linux containers on Android. Um, uh, I remember there was an issue years ago of, of someone wanting like um, ARM versions of the containers so that they could try to run them on Android. And that's what makes me think that it might be possible. Um, but but yeah, there's, there isn't currently uh, like, this is not mobile is not in the roadmap right now. Yeah, exactly. And to to speak to what you just mentioned, so in order to be able to run this on Android, even though it's running Linux underneath, we'd need for the operating system to expose that to applications so they could take advantage of this. Otherwise, we'd need kind of like a security focused operating system that would give this kind of like access. Um, so yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so like maybe Calyx OS or something could could have it, but it couldn't be in the Play Store. The uh, mobile versus desktop question kind of ties into my own question um, in terms of the spectrum of, of who's using Danger Zone. Um, some of the services FPF does, like digital security training, anti-docs, 
training is applicable to a lot of people. Um, and some of the things we do, like the secure drop project, only journalists are using. Um, where would you rate danger zone on that kind of spectrum? Um, I would say that it's much wider than secure drop. I think that um, uh, for a number of reasons, one of them being that it's much, much us more usable. Like anybody can just use danger zone. Uh, not anyone can just install secure drop and start using it. Um, I think that journalists are definitely a key target, but I really think that it's anybody that has to open documents um, uh, could, will, will benefit from using the Android then. Thank you. Um, next question is, how did you choose the auditor for the security audit? Uh, Francisco, do you want to take that one? Uh, I'm not super familiar with how the, the decision was made, uh, but if uh, someone from, from Mafia who is involved in that uh, is around, maybe they can clarify that. Well, that's definitely a question I can I answer in a follow-up email um, and, and in the more info about this event after it goes into the FPF archive. So I'll keep that question in mind. The next question is, have there been any thoughts on creating a web service that could be locally hosted for organizations so that individual users don't need to run it individually? Um, yes, <laughs> I would actually really love this. Um, uh, it, it hasn't actually been made yet, but we've definitely discussed this. Um, and one of the big reasons is because, you know, at The Intercept, some of the journalists use Danger Zone, but many of the journalists when they have documents that are malicious, they just contact the security team and they say, hey, can you make these safe for me? And then we just use Danger Zone for them and then send them back. Um, and so having a web service will be a great way to, to solve this problem. Like the um, big issue here is that the web service is sort of a central point of attack and it's like a server that's always online. And this is a place where potentially secret documents will be getting placed. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's something to consider. But basically, like, I think that this will be a great future feature of Danger Zone, like a web service mode of it. Um, and newsrooms will be able to maybe uh, like host it locally um, and uh, uh, allow their staff to use it. Um, Francisco, I don't know if you have anything to add about that. And this could potentially be an avenue for enabling mobile users to actually use it. Um, so it's it's it wouldn't be super integrated, but already better uh, than nothing. But again, there are those issues that need to be considered uh, because if we if we make it too wide, such as for example, like a public service that would do this, that would be a very bad idea because uh, that would like be exposed to a lot of potential attacks but potentially doing it within within a newsroom could be an interesting idea i think overall these discussions are always like in terms of like how much can we make it like security is about economics right danger zone brings a very niche feature of a niche operating system and i use it every day but it's that's the reality of it to a large amount of users so if we can increase security by making it easier to use then that would be it like a, an overall win. Yeah, and I also do see benefits of there maybe even being a public danger zone that anyone could upload to and just, you know, have big strong warnings being like, don't put secret documents, just put stuff that you want to know is you want to open, <laughs> but you are worried or going to like leak secrets to anybody or something like that maybe the stuff that you already work with. So for example, public leaks or anything like that, that's already public. That could be it. Yeah. 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 I mean, other, other advice that I've told people, uh, you know, before danger zone existed was like, um, upload your documents to Google drive. If, if they're not super secret, put them in Google drive and then view them in the Google, in your web browser in the Google drive preview. This way, if they're malicious, they'll be attacking Google's conversion process to convert from like a word document to a Google doc or whatever instead of attacking Microsoft Word on your computer. Um, and it could be something similar to that. Interesting. Um, 
one of the other things mentioned was it did not support password protected files. So please say more about that. Why are they difficult to support? What is the time frame for supporting them? Um, it seems like it could be a serious attacker. Uh, a, a serious attacker could exploit this. Yeah, so the reason, uh, maybe Micah has uh, some other comments, but I think the reason why we don't support is because we still haven't uh, added the support for it. So it's not that it's particularly complicated. Uh, it's just a matter of, like we need to think about how, how to do this uh, UX wise, how do we expose it back to the user? Hey, this document has a password, and then they can, uh, like, the user can type it. So it's it's more of a how do we actually make this uh, UX wise? And I think that's that would be the biggest uh, the biggest challenge. But all of the all of the things that we're uh, discussing here, like practically all of them, are available on GitHub, which is a platform where we do the open source development of Danger Zone. And there are already discussions about most of these topics. So if you want, you can look, take a look at the current issues that we have. I'll share the link on the I'll share the link on the chat. And so you can just uh, see what's out there and contribute to these discussions because that's that's what uh, open source development is about. Uh, getting a community of people who can actually contribute to the project, be it technical or just in terms of discussions. Uh, so yeah, you're more than welcome to contribute to these. <clears throat> um, you both have mentioned a different number of operating systems. So this question uh, kind of considers that. For Linux backends, have you considered using Firecracker VM framework to run the translation process in lieu or in place of the Docker container? That's something that I'm not familiar with. So if you if you want to um, come around on the on the danger zone uh, repository on GitHub and tell us like what would be the advantages and everything, we'd be happy to listen and consider. I appreciate that that question was immediately after your plea to, to help on the GitHub. That's that's great, Francisco. Um, another question, this one's for Micah. Um, could you get into a little bit more in depth? I think I know you, you talked about it at the start. Um, how did you come up with the idea of Danger Zone? I mean, really, I, well, with a lot of the software that I write, I write it because I kind of, um, have a need and then I'm just like, I'll just write some code to, to do it for me. And with Danger Zone, um, I was getting a lot of people uh, sending me uh, documents at the Intercept, be a lot of journalists at the Intercept sending me documents that they were getting being like, uh, can you tell if this is safe or not? Or can you, you know, like make it safe for me to look at? I really want to see this. And so what I would do is I would just, if it, for PDFs, I would just run it through trusted PDF. Um, and I was kind of like, you know, like, like Max have, uh, you could run Docker containers on Max. And so it's totally possible to build something like trusted PDF on Max, but then also people would send me other formats too. And I was like, oh, I could use, you know, like headless LibreOffice to convert this to a PDF and then run it through trusted PDF. Um, and I was like, I should just automate this. And that was, I mean, that was basically it is like journalists at the intercept sending me documents and also myself getting documents that I wanted to open that weren't PDFs. Like I would use trusted PDF all the time, but I would sometimes get other documents that weren't PDFs. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of the features were like, a lot of times I'd have like a 500 K PDF that I would to convert with trusted PDF and the final version was like five megabytes. And I would be like, oh, this is this is silly. I can compress it because um, it doesn't need to be five megabytes. And so when I started making Danger Zone, I was just like, I'll just do all of the things that I want. I'll just like try and automate all of this stuff together. Um, and, that, and that was basically it. It's just uh, uh, out of people that I work with needing documents and also me needing documents to be um, sanitized and to know and to be able to view them and read them without uh, worrying about getting hacked. Thanks. Appreciate you diving into that. Um, the next question kind of is about file size, uh, capacity, software, hardware requirements. Um, is there any way to estimate how much available space is necessary to convert a PDF file? Is that related to the number of pages, something else? Uh, the motivation to the question being folks having a limited space, uh, one gigabyte as an example, looks like a danger zone users use this path or mount point to work within temporary files. 
if that question makes sense. If uh, it doesn't to me, <laughs> I hope it does to you. Yeah, I think I think I can answer that. So basically, danger zone uses a small like the original file is quite small, and then like it kind of like expands all of this file into just a series of pixels and a bunch of images, and then it kind of like puts them all together. And for people who have uh, some limited systems, specifically like on on Linux, I think it like for larger files like more than 150. Uh, there may there may be issues, but I think this is on very limited systems. But in any case, this is something that we're working on now that we're kind of like bringing danger zone back into cubes. We're dealing with the smaller limitations because in cubes everything runs in virtual machines, and virtual machines like are typically more limited because they're just running in a portion of your system. And so something that we'll be working on is kind of like making sure that the intermediate size is smaller, or that we're for example like um, like already as we're going through the documents, we're kind of like compressing it at the end so that we don't have to do first the first phase, then like putting it in the screenshots and then we compress everything. Uh, so we'll be kind of like streaming the data and doing that as we receive it. And that way, hopefully there will be uh, no longer any problems with like lack of temporary space on your system. Thank you so much, Francisco. I now understand what the question was asking because of that explanation. I appreciate that. Um, this question I, I think would be for Micah. I have certainly some thoughts on it. Um, why did Freedom of the Press Foundation take on the project? When I first heard about Danger Zone, uh, I thought it was a perfect fit. You have known FPF much longer. Um, so why were you okay letting FPF kind of shepherd this, this baby of yours? I mean, I think that it was a perfect fit also. Um, like I've worked with uh, FPF since it started and um, uh, you know, I know a lot of the secure drop developers and I've contributed to secure drop before. And so I thought that if um, someone was gonna uh, kind of help take over the project, FPF will be great for it. And um, specifically FPF had the funding to hire some uh, developers like Francisco um and uh i and and so danger zone started out as basically like a project an open source project that i was doing at the intercept and um i was basically the only developer and i was doing it kind of in my spare time when i didn't have more pressing things um and I think that if FPF didn't take it over, it probably would still be, I probably wouldn't have added any more features. It would still be what it was like a year ago. There would there be way fewer features and it wouldn't be under active development. And I feel like FPF taking it over kind of really like made it so that it's an active, uh, you know, lively maintained open source project that's uh, getting better and better over time instead of just, you know, uh, like little project that I made a few years ago and then don't have time to work on anymore. So <laughs> I think that it's in a much better place than, than it was. And I'm really happy about that. Well, thank you, Micah. Um, but one of the follow-up questions is how much does it cost to develop and maintain? Um, I am happy to dive into that in the post event summary um, in terms of how big the team is, what those future goals are um, and where our, our donation dollars are, are allocated. Um, supporting the project, certainly um, as a fundraiser, I would love to see you guys give us sustaining donations, whether those are annual or monthly. Um, but Danger Zone is one of our projects now that general support, general donations are, are going to keep alive. Um, another question about uh, related to integration. I know you already mentioned integrating it onto Secure Drop. This one is about email. Are there plans for a version that can be integrated into an email exchange server so that some or all incoming attachments are sanitized before being passed through to end users? Not, not that I've uh, that I've seen in our discussions, but I think that's a potentially very interesting idea. I think something that we that could be interesting in the future is to make danger zone like extensible, such that if someone develops a, an email server or they want to build an extension they could just integrate danger zone onto that. So I think that would be the best the best way to frame it. So danger zone as the as the core project would be focused on a desktop application 
or potentially a few other things. But then it would be extensible by other developers who have their own applications and then they want to do their sanitization. So for example, another, another idea would be uh, Aleph from OCCRP where like journalists basically like dig into documents and sometimes they need to download documents to analyze them or like uh, read them later. And so integrating danger zone into these kinds of products would, would be a very suitable um, idea, I think. I also think that uh, I, I think that it, integrating it into mail servers or, or just email clients, like maybe making a, a, an add-on that you could add to your email client that, that does danger zone automatically is a um, very interesting idea and it will be uh, very cool. But also like sometimes it's really good for people to have original documents. And so I think, I don't know, there's, th there's things to consider, like maybe add safe versions as, along with the unsafe versions or like, I don't know, zip up the unsafe versions to make them harder to access or something like that. Um, uh, and then this would, could be bypassed with encrypted email, but <laughs> those are just some thoughts. Well, I appreciate the brainstorming aspect of this Q and A, uh, very much in the heart of the open source, source software. Um, I know there are a few questions that I need to follow up on in the post event summary, such as the security audit information and how to specifically support danger zone. Um, however, I think that may be all the questions. Micah, Francisco, thank you both so much for joining us. Um, was there anything you guys wanted to add after the discussion? Thank you very much. Nothing from my side. Nothing from my side. Thanks for joining us. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. This uh, conversation has been recorded and I'll notify you when it's in the FPF event archives. Thanks again, everyone.